The following episode contains sensitive topic information that may not be appropriate for young listeners, as well as religious or other views that may not reflect those of the Sirens team. Hello. Hi. Hi, Lindsay. Hello to our listeners and viewers. We got a special episode tonight, but first, hope everyone's having a great week. Maybe a little spooky, spookiness going on (laughs) in your life. We're about to bring you some in this episode. I was going to say, if not, (laughs) this episode is going to be pretty spooky. Yep. Yep. The only way it could be spookier is if we were in an actual hospital doing an on site investigation. (laughs) Oh my gosh. An on site seance. Oh, in the hospital. We'll bring a Ouija board and we can light candles. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't mess with Ouija boards. Fine, I'll do it myself. Just kidding. <laughs> but, I don't think you can. I don't think you can do it by yourself, actually. Yeah, I don't think you can. But <laughs> I bet if you did, a hospital would be one place to find a lot of interaction. Yeah. With the spirit. Everybody's, everybody's always like, oh, graveyards are so haunted. Graveyards are so haunted. But people don't usually die in a graveyard they yeah, die yeah. at the hospital yep. so wouldn't that be more haunted i don't know i would, for th- thought i would definitely think so <laughs> so without further ado we do have a special guest tonight and we're so excited because we wanted to have her on for a while it is Lindsay's sister courtney my other daughter and so I'm just so psyched to have both of them on the podcast tonight, all three of us together. And poor Ron couldn't be here. He got tied up at work. So it's girls night. Hey, Courtney. Hi. <laughs> girls night. Welcome. Say hello as well, <laughs> and yes, yeah. we all have dogs. Yeah. And <laughs> Courtney, what's Bailey doing over there? Well, the neighbor's dog just decided to bark right before you brought oh. me in, so she needed to bark back. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, gotcha. You well, got to you gotta put them in their place. Yeah. yeah. Courtney's enjoying <laughs> uh, a day off today, and so she has time to actually record with us. Um, but she works some long hours sometimes, and we're going to let her give you guys a little bit of her uh, medical background, tell you about it. Well... I have worked in healthcare since 2012 when I started working as a nurse on a med surge floor. I worked five and a half years of nights there. And then I transferred to the ER and worked two-ish years as a nurse in the ER and then switched to my current role, which is a nurse practitioner in the ER since 2020. Oh, wow. I didn't realize. (sighs) She's such a professional. (laughs) 12 years. It's been a long time. Yeah, a long <laughs> yes. Time. And working nights is hard enough, but yeah. you know, I imagine that was pretty stressful sometimes. And then, and then you went to the ER. <laughs> yeah. And that seems um, pretty stressful to me. And just so all our uh, loyal listeners out there know, Courtney didn't get any of that from me. Like I could <laughs> no. never be a nurse or anyone in the, in the health profession. Uh, that's just not my cup of tea, but we are so thankful for Courtney and um, others that do that. As a matter of fact, her husband is also a nurse practitioner. So uh, we just hats off, hats off <laughs> to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's 12 years you've been working in the hospital. Um, so I know that you have um, an experience to share with us. Um, but I want you to tell our listeners, uh, as far as the supernatural goes, um, are you as into it as me and Lindsay? Do you believe in it? What's your uh, thoughts there? I like supernatural stuff and I believe in it, but like when y'all went and locked yourself into the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum for the night, that wasn't my tea. That you was, thought we were lunatics, didn't you? In that. I went and toured it during the day and had a good time, but uh-huh. I'm not trying to get locked in with nothing. <laughs> Got you. And Courtney is also the one who went to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, yeah. saw the Mothman statue, went to the museum, and Lindsay and I are hoping to get there. We were a little jealous. Well, when you go, you got to go around to the backside of the Mothman. That's what I it's said. It's called the shiny hiney. 
<laughs> That's what we heard. I heard they she have does. t-shirts that say, I touched the shiny yeah. honey. And I they will do. be getting one because I will be touching it. <laughs> we went, when we went, we like walked and looked and took pictures. And then we went into the little museum and saw the t-shirts. And I was like, well, now I got to walk around behind it and see. Yeah. It. And he does. Right. His you honey. didn't get a t-shirt? I got a Mothman t-shirt, but not one that said I touched the shiny honey. <laughs> Yeah, I I'm guess sure you would have had to explain that to every person who saw you. Yeah, wearing. probably. <laughs> if they hadn't been there. So so you do, you you believe in the supernatural, but you just don't put yourself out there as much. <laughs> I have a healthy respect for them. They, gotcha. they can do their thing and I'll do mine. <laughs> okay, agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> we might still get you to go on an on-site investigation someday with us. Probably yeah. during the day. Something during yeah. the day. Yes. <laughs> but Lindsay, we had some weird experiences at the Trans Allegheny during the day. <laughs> I know when um when I do my I'm gonna do an episode, I think, where like I tell you guys, like you and Ryan, all my mm -hmm. supernatural experiences, and that's definitely at the top of the list. Okay. Cause that was a that was a trip. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it really was. It really was. <laughs> well, Courtney, um, now you have worked at the same hospital all these 12 years. Yes. Um, did it ever, were you ever, before you share your experience, did it ever creep you out like working at night there? Yeah. I mean, if anywhere is going to be haunted, a hospital, I think will, because like if your spirit stays where you die, lots of people die in the hospital. And like the unit that I worked on, it was shaped like a T, the med surge unit. So mm -hmm. they would remodel each wing occasionally. And then that wing would just be shut down. But there's still an omni cell, which has all the medicine up into the hallway. So Ooh. you'd have to just walk down a deserted hallway <gasps> in the middle of the night to get medicine out of there. I didn't like that. I did not know that. Wow. So I'm like, That's I can walk crazy. down this hallway 200 times a night when there's people down here and there's patients. But the doors are shut. It's like mm -hmm. nobody in there. It's creepy. Changes the whole dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. That's really creepy. That is creepy. <laughs> and and I, I feel like a lot of people think hospitals are creepy anyway, <laughs> much yeah. less a deserted hallway. Yeah, for sure. Especially like those old creepy abandoned hospitals. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I do tell about, um, you said you had at least one experience to share with us. I'm sure that I'm sure you could gather lots of other people's experiences if you, if you, you know, had time and they would talk to you about them. <laughs> but yeah, tell I us. a few people, but they were like, uh -huh. I, don't, I can't remember anything. So, <laughs> okay. Well, we're glad. Well, I mean, I'm not glad you got, you had a creepy experience, <laughs> but I'm glad that you can remember it and want to share it with us. Well, I mean, it was creepy. So it stuck okay. with me. Well, okay. go ahead. So. <laughs> I don't remember what year it was. It was one of the years I was working nights on the med search floor. So like I said before, the unit was like T-shaped. So like right at the top of the T would be the nurse's station. Then it goes out and then it, a hallway goes down. So there's three hallways. Mm -hmm. So this woman, this old woman was a patient in room six, which is all the way at the far end of the first hallway, all the way at the end. Mm -hmm. So I'm down there with my little roller computer, giving her meds. I was in the room talking to her and it was later than the first med pass. So it was probably midnight-ish time. I don't recall exactly what time it was, but there wasn't really much else going on down that hallway. The other patients were quiet in their rooms. There weren't any other staff members down the hallway with me. So I was getting ready to go out of the room. I had turned off her big light. So she just had her little sink light on and she was the only person in this room. It was just her in the bed. So I'm pushing my cart out and I was like, okay, well, just hit your call bell if you need anything. And then she whispers, I don't think she heard you. And I don't know who she was talking to, <laughs> but I just kept pushing that cart right on out that door and closed it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You saw her whisper that? No, I heard her say it. My back. Are you sure her. it was her? <laughs> yes. Pretty sure it was her talking Absolutely to some unknown not. thing in the room with me. I don't know what it was, but oh. I'm glad that I didn't hear it. And I just kept going out the door. 
Oh my gosh. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was oh. creepy. And it wasn't like she just said, hey, I don't think she heard you. It was like a creepy whisper. I don't think she heard you. You know those <laughs> old ladies, they can creepy whisper. I'm literally going to hear that in my sleep. <laughs> um. I, I was like, nope. And I pushed my computer out in the hallway <laughs> and plugged it up. And then I went right back up to the nurse's station where all my <laughs> other coworkers were. And I was like, something oh, really man. creepy just happened. Oh. Did you have to go back there that night? Yeah, but that nothing else happened. Happened. That was the mm-hmm. only time that she whispered at you? Or yeah. I guess maybe at something else? Yeah. Yeah. That was the only time. I and I knew she wasn't talking to me. Because why would I have said something right. that somebody else didn't hear? Because it's just me and her in the room. <laughs> creepy. Or or was it? I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just me and her that I could else. see. But after she said that, like the little hairs on my neck stood up. And I was just like, I Ooh. thought for a half second about being like, what? But I was like, no. You didn't even try to mind your business sometimes, you know? Uh, I had already said, let me know if you need anything and go on on back up the hall. So you didn't even turn around. Nope. <laughs> she don't play. She's on business. I <laughs> know. Yeah, Courtney don't Very play. Clear. I was like, whatever's in here ain't attaching itself to me. <laughs> Steve walking out nope. the door. <laughs> Did you ever have any experiences with patients who like said they saw something else in the room or yeah we had down the same hallway um it was like I feel like it was at least two nights in a row if not three maybe because sometimes I would work three in a row like patients down the hallway said that this person was coming into their room in the middle of the night and you go in there and there'd be nobody in there and they're like they are there somebody's coming in here and you're like there's nobody in here. Like we got a lot of confused old people with dementia and then they're in the hospital. They get more confused. But then one night someone was standing at the nurse's station where they could see down the hallway. And it was one of the other old confused patients just wandering into other people's room. Oh. <laughs> oh. But we had been like, nobody's coming in here. And they're like, yeah, somebody was. Oh, no. <laughs> I was going to ask, did they all describe the person the same way? <laughs> I can't remember how they described him, but they kept somebody, somebody came in here and used my bathroom, and we're like, no, they didn't. Well, <laughs> yeah, they did. They <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure did. So we had to go. Oh, and of course, he was um, in a hospital gown, which is open in the back with nothing else on and his little walker. <laughs> so you could just. See, you can see the shiny hiney. You can see yeah, the little shiny see. hiney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor little old guy. Um, I know you've had, you've probably seen a lot in your 12 years yeah. working in a hospital. And I know you've had angry patients and <laughs> everything yeah. from patients that had guards with them because they came from, from the, the prison. Jail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you've seen a lot. Uh, and I know you've dealt with saving lives. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's just someone's time to go. So you've had to deal with death. Have you ever had to, do they have like certain people on each floor that take bodies to the morgue? Or Oh my gosh, I was literally going to ask that. <laughs> um, no, after somebody dies, then like you bathe them. So you mm-hmm. kind of clean them up. You remove any kind of tubes they might have, IVs, whatever. And then, like, usually either the tech or the nurse will push the stretcher to the morgue. And then, like, you put them. It usually takes a couple people to put somebody down there. But mm-hmm. it's a, it's not super big. So sometimes there would be other bodies in there when you would take one down. Sometimes it wasn't. Did that ever freak you out? Yeah, it. I had to go by myself, which I think only happened one time, but most of the time I was with like one of my friends. So we would just like kind of joke around about, talk about other things to distract ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like a lot of scary stories I've heard about in the hospitals have had to do with the morgue or going to the morgue or. Yeah. Which I mean, and maybe it's bigger in bigger hospitals, but ours is not that big. Like it's one 
room with like mm-hmm. four shelves. So shelves, they just put them on shelves. Well, yeah. Then I mean, usually they're not there for that long because the next day the whichever funeral home will come and get them. Is it ever weird, like cleaning them up? I guess and like knowing that. There's just no, there's nothing in there anymore. Yeah, but they say that like hearing is the last thing to go. So yeah. sometimes I would like still talk to them while I was cleaning. Oh, oh my god! I'm gonna. Oh, oh, that that's, so one, that's so sad. It was sad. This little old woman, she coded and she had to go through like compressions and all this stuff, oh. and it was which coding someone is kind of brutal anyway. I'm mean, if you've never seen it, like it can be rough but you're trying to save somebody's life Mm -hmm. but hers was a little rougher than other people and I was just like Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that that happened to you while I was cleaning her up just like I'm sorry I just want you to know that and 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 if yeah if hearing's the last thing to go then they're hearing all of that and that would I can't imagine I'm sure it's stressful for you guys too I'm sure it's it's stressful for the medical professionals that are Adam said one time when he was working in the ICU I don't know if it was when he was um, a hospitalist nurse practitioner when he was still in a nurse in the ICU that they coded somebody for a while and then that person died and he's like as soon as they like died the temperature in the room dropped like 30 degrees I've heard that too it got real cold and then everybody has the superstition like open the window when somebody dies yeah so they're not trapped yeah, there still has to get out. Yeah. Or else wow. they're trapped in the hospital with you. So do they do that? Do they actually open the window like when somebody passes? Not really. And most hospital windows don't really open don't either. Open. Yeah. I was going to say, I kind of thought that they were like glued shut or something. So some of them, it depends on like what kind of floor you're on, will open like mm-hmm. just a little bit, but mm-hmm. the majority yeah. of them just stay closed. Have you ever had any experience with family members, uh, you know, of people who have passed in the hospital? Like, what's it like? I guess you guys don't really see them after the body is is taken. Not after the body is taken. Now, in the ER, like, people come in yeah, with, the, like, getting impressions and stuff all the time. So then the doctor will have to go out to where the family is and tell them, and then they'll bring them back. And that it's just always so sad. Traumatic, probably. So the yeah. doctor has to go get them and bring them yeah. back and, t- and explain what's going on. Yeah. Are that's... y'all are still working on them? Sometimes, because sometimes if it's like they, it's highly unlikely that somebody's going to come back and have, like, even if they did come back, they would probably be more of a vegetable. So sometimes they'll bring the family back to say, do you want us to keep trying Mm. or not? And so that can be a rough decision for people to make too. Right. Yeah. But I mean, if just so y'all know, Adam knows this already anyway, if I would have something ever happened to me and they said I was going to be a vegetable, just don't even don't make me live like that. Just let me go. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and it's a good time to point out too, you know, for people to, if they have specific wishes to write those down, get a do not resuscitate or whatever they want to do before, you know, something were to happen and your family is making that decision. You can get, um, do a living will. So you can get your, the paperwork Mm -hmm. for that from your regular doctor. And then you just have to have it notarized. And And then where do you put it? And then you can give it to your doctor, but keep a copy as well. And that lays yeah. out, like, if you couldn't make decisions, who could make decisions for you and what you would want so mm-hmm. that people aren't guessing what you would want. Right. And, and that, would like that would stress me take, out. Yeah. And I feel like that would take a lot of guilt away from the people that are left yes. trying to make a decision, too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's some good advice right there, listeners, um, you know, for all of us. I mean, I, that I was going to say, if it was me and there was still a little bit of a chance, just pull the plug because I'm tired. <laughs> like, I'm a little <laughs> I'm tired, ready to go. so I would be fine. 
Uh, <laughs> make sure that I'm not in the middle of a book when I die because I can't go forever yeah. not knowing how it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could read it to you. We could. <laughs> Uh, can read it to you. Just keep you in that veggie state for yeah. like a week or so until we're okay. done with the book. And then this is terrible, y'all. We should be joking about <laughs> this. Listen, I feel like ninety percent of people have this sense of humor, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Especially probably yeah, our listeners do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we cater to a specific kind of audience. <laughs> I like um, a bit of dark humor, but it's all in good fun. You gotta stay weird. Make and you know how many supernatural, I had no idea how many supernatural paranormal podcasts there are out there until we got our feet wet in, oh, in that realm. There are so many and uh, there's so many. I want to listen to them all. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't know if it's still a thing, but like the Society of Psychical Research, mm -hmm. that team that they put together and they kind of investigated, um, oh, what was that? It was the second Conjuring movie. It was in England, and it was that haunting. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? I yes. don't remember. Like the, was that the Ingfield Poulter? The Ingfield, yeah. Yeah. And they went and they researched that. I wish there was another, like, modern-day Society for Psychical Research that I could just join and go research stuff with people. Maybe just, like, is. see there. Maybe like there is. Maybe we'll get an email about it. But it we probably costs invited. a lot of money. Yeah, it's probably really expensive <laughs> yeah. to join. Maybe yeah. we should just start one. Yeah, there you and go. And say, hey, we'll be investigating at this place. Pull up. Like, bring your Ouija board. Come on down. Bring your night vision cam. Like, we're going <laughs> to. Bring your, uh, what is the little static monitors that they use to try to record voices? EFP. A little EFP. <laughs> Bring that <laughs> digital. Lindsay, you got, recorder. we have a couple of, of yeah. little digital I recorders. have the one from when we went to Trans Allegheny. I don't think we really caught anything, though. I know. I downloaded all those audio files onto my computer, and I didn't really hear anything. And it was so funny, because when we started, like, at the beginning of the night, it was so intense, and everybody's, like, you could feel the energy was so almost like staticky and everybody was nervous and it was really mm -hmm. high up there but then by the end of the night when it was like i don't know 4 45 5 a.m yeah mom was like taking a nap up against the wall she was like i believe I'm, it i'm done with this i'm surprised I'm it took her that long to fall <laughs> oh <laughs> oh i was do like this couple there that actually had um <laughs> investigating tools and stuff the ones where you have one person has the headphones on the other person asks questions and they can hear voices and they'll say no but they can't people. hear the questions yeah so they can't hear the questions and they were doing a session like that in one of the rooms and i just turned to the side because there was there was one chair in the room and mom was sitting in the chair <clears> and i was sitting on the floor and i just turned to her because i was gonna ask her something or say something and i she was just out she was out she was taking a little nap and i was like damn <laughs> she's not even scared anymore like, this is these ghosts could have got her by now <laughs> but and me and Lindsay, we were wandering down these long dark hallways just like yeah. by ourselves and i was like i don't feel anything but like a sense of i didn't feel fear i just felt no. sadness yeah you know it was, because, it was heavy yeah. and you could feel that there were other people there like the way the wings were set up there's like a part in the middle and then there's a wing to the left and the right and you, we had the whole like section to ourselves every hour of the night we would go to a different floor so you could feel that there were there were other people there on the same floor as you, but I don't know. It was just that night. I was expecting so much out of that night, I think, because from the first time that we went and everything that happened then, but nothing really happened that night. So I was just kind of yeah. like, I mean, it was so fun and I'm so glad we got to go and do it. And the tour guides and all their stories were so Amazing. good. Yeah. But I just, I guess I was expecting more to happen. And I think part of it is like to blame on these paranormal and ghost shows that, <laughs> that everything, we happens, yeah. everything in the world happens that same night that they go investigate, they get all this information. When in reality, it yeah. takes a long time to get anything yeah. at all. And I feel like, I feel like a lot of those ghost hunter shows, a lot of them go to old abandoned hospitals and, and asylums and they seem to always catch something there. You know, I don't know oh, how 
real it is. Have good TV. <laughs> exactly. Zach, Zach Bagans. He <laughs> he gets possessed by a spirit every time. He gets so pissed off at Aaron. It's so angry. Every episode. <laughs> I, there's this girl on TikTok. I don't know her name, but she does the funniest impersonation of him. She does. Like she has she has the trucker hat. She draws this little mustache <laughs> on, and she has all the clothes that he has. And she'll be like, "This is a 1800s farmhouse that hasn't been investigated in 20 years." And then she goes inside, and she's like, "At this exact moment, I felt my inner rage come out." <laughs> And go right towards Aaron. And then she turns around and she's like, Aaron. <laughs> That's so great. Good. Like it's exactly like the show. It's so Are funny. they still making episodes of that show? Uh, I don't know. Oh. I feel like he has because he has his museum now and he has a show or he had a show that was kind of paired with the museum. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I've there was to some the museum. Yes, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. And which we can tell stories from that in a second, but there's another show too. I don't know if they still make ghost adventures now. Yeah, I don't either. I don't think so. I might be wrong, but I think he yeah. had his 15 minutes of fame there and then he went on to other things <laughs> like his museum that Courtney has been to. Tell us mm -hmm. about that, Courtney. Yeah, do tell, do tell. <laughs> it was so fun, but it was also so cheesy. It was cheesy. Like, <laughs> yes. Because you know how he is on the show. Yeah. So there's like these Very videos dramatic. or like audio recordings that you listen oh, to. Oh, he wasn't there? No. If he was, he didn't come out. No. Oh, okay. So you go <laughs> and you had, you had to pay extra for this other like extra tour. So we would get to places in the house and stop. And if the, there was only one girl on our tour that paid extra and the guy that she was with did not pay extra to do it. He was like, I'm not doing it. So she like. <laughs> had to go down these stairs by herself to where this like pentagram was on the floor and then just the weird stuff. <laughs> That's but it. you you go in these rooms and they like play their little sound bite about where what you're looking at. And like I swear everyone felt like talk about the whatever the object was and he would be like then after he talked about how haunted it was he'd be like and I bought it for twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. He does. That's how he talks. He's so yeah. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then I was talking about how much money he spent on this. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. So much. He's but money dropping room, instead of name dropping. There was this one room we went in and it was like all dark. And like then they started playing this video and it was about somebody's, some old Hollywood car engine that's supposed to be haunted. I don't know. But then the lights came up and there's the engine and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So scary. <laughs> it's that engine. I was like, okay. <laughs> and there it, it is. Tour. They had all kinds of stuff. Things you're supposed to say hello to and goodbye to when you go in and out of rooms. Things you're not supposed to touch. Of course, uh. Adam had to be a rebel, my husband, and touch one of them. But it's, they said if you touched it, then you'd have nightmares forever. He never had any nightmares. <laughs> My favorite episode of like the museum one is when um, they got Annabelle, the doll, to come there. And she's like in this case. And it's him and the guy that brought Annabelle. And I don't remember if he was Ed and Lorraine Warren's stepson or son. He was related to them somehow. And so they're sitting there in the dark on either side of this case. And it's like the night vision camera. And Zach's like, I really feel like she wants me to touch her, man. And the guy's like, you can't no. do that, Zach. Because he told him beforehand, he was like, if you touch her, like, I have to take her and leave. Like, you cannot touch her at all. Not even the case. And Zach's like, <laughs> he's sitting in the chair. And you can slowly see his arm in the dark. Room. Like, he's trying to touch it. And this is like, I have to touch it. <laughs> so dramatic. Did he touch it? I think he did touch the case. I don't know. <laughs> so he wasn't even supposed to touch the case? No. no. Wow. No, she's she's real bad. She's a baddie. Ugh. Dramatic. <laughs> that's a, that's funny. Well, well, we've gotten just a little bit off. Track. We did, but that's um, okay. <laughs> but that's fine. Mom, do you want to start with some of your stories that you found? Yeah, sure. I found some creepy um hospital stories 
that may give you the heebie-jeebies. Courtney, you'd be thinking about these next time you're working. Okay. <laughs> okay, so these are all really short, but um, they're good ones. Um, so I looked up, I got on BuzzFeed, because <laughs> that's such a reputable... <laughs> I love BuzzFeed. I have a great time. I know. I love it. So they had um, 16 weird and creepy stories from hospital workers. That'll give you the heebie-jeebies is where I got that. But I just pulled one from, from that one. And it's uh, it was sent in by Simple Simon 6262. So um, he says, when I was a student, I got called in on a stroke patient. She had coded and they were doing CPR. They worked for 45 minutes, but she died. They cleaned her up and called on the family to say goodbye. By the time the family left, she had been both brain dead and without a pulse for more than 45 minutes. Blood had filled her brain. She was completely gray and started to smell. Suddenly, she sat up and called for her family. The nurses rushed to get monitors and equipment back on her. They started working on her again. She stabilized, said goodbye to her family, and promptly died a second time. Ooh. You so need an old priest and a young business. priest for that. Do what? What'd you say, said, You need an old priest and a young priest for that. <laughs> I mean, how does that medically, that medically, that's impossible, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is so strange. Like somebody sent her back so she could say goodbye. Yeah. She's like, I ain't done. I didn't get to say goodbye to my family. I'm going back. No. She probably, yeah, no, wait a minute. <laughs> she's up there for 45 minutes nagging somebody until they're like, fine. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's up there like pitching a fit, like, no, I have to go back and say goodbye. Oh, we can make like, anything fine, funny, fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right here's though that she turned gray and then just sat yeah. straight up yeah the i think hell? I that's so scary. I, that me end. too that's what i was thinking when i read this i was like yeah i'd have been out <laughs> and, just he was, screaming. <laughs> and he was a, you said a student at that time or he was let's see like a new yeah he was a student <laughs> oh my god that would have been the day that I would have been like rethinking my thrown in the towel future career. That's enough for me. Thanks. I'd yeah. be like, you know what? I think I'm gonna switch careers. I might just stay home and make cakes and be like a baker mm. because yeah. I can't. <laughs> I wouldn't have been going back after that. I'll tell you. That's so no. scary. It is. Um, and here's one. It says a spooky but sweet goodbye. Um, I'm an oh, and this is from. Jess Panda Pants. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> these names crack the name. up. Panda um, Pants. <laughs> I'm an RN, and while I was a student, here's another student, I was caring for a lady who had end-stage renal failure. She had a DNAR. What is that, Courtney? Do not like attempt to resuscitate. Attempt to resuscitate. Okay. And uh, she was shutting down. We were having a little chat when she stopped looked over my shoulder and said, Bill's here, love, I've got to go, and swiftly stopped breathing. I read her old notes, and Bill was her deceased husband. And Ooh, I have sweet. heard, I heard my aunt say, uh, who was in the room with my grandmother when she passed, um, that she, that she felt a presence in the room, like right before my mama passed. And she said she felt like it was her dad who had uh, died previously coming to get mama. And I thought that was so sweet. There's a lot of times like these little old people that are like slowly dying. Like you're like, they're probably not going to make it out of the hospital. Start talking about seeing family members that have passed away. And then it's, It's like lose? they come to get her. Okay. You yeah. you broke you you went out there for a minute. What it did just you froze for it froze for a second and I was like, are we paused or are we <laughs> so you said they they, they start the story. They stop it. <laughs> you said they start seeing like they say they see people that, yeah, that have died gone. and it's mm -hmm. like they're coming to yeah. take them with them. 
hospice workers, uh, you, you can read some good yeah. stories from them too about that kind of thing. Um, here's another one, and this is from Samster338. Um, Samster says, I used to work in a personal care home. A couple of times, a day or so after a resident had passed, their call bell would go off in their room. But no one was in the room when the call bell went off on any of the occasions. We had one resident die pretty traumatically. Nurses had to perform CPR because he was a full code. That night, the midnight staff said they saw him at the end of the hall just walking down the hall like he always did. And then the alarm on the door to the outside because it was a secured unit for Alzheimer's dementia, went off. It was the door he always tried when he was looking to get out. So, uh, and then I found uh, this next one on a website called trustedhealth.com slash blogs slash spooky nursing stories. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Y'all don't laugh at my source. <laughs> Um, this person says, I'll never forget this experience from my early days as a pediatric nurse. Hey, why are all these stories from like students in early days? <laughs> like, that is strange. I don't do know. people get jaded after a while and they just oh, chalk yeah. things up to coincidence, Probably. whatever? Yeah. Um, working in one of the oldest wings of the hospital during the night shift, I witnessed something that still puzzles me to this day. Children who are generally extraordinarily perceptive began noticing an unexplained presence precisely around six in the morning. Several of them, unprompted and with striking consistency, asked about the doctor who had just visited them. They all described him as a tall figure with gray hair and glasses and always wearing a white coat. Eventually, I had to ask my colleagues about this mysterious man. Oh, that sounds like Dr. So-and-so, they said nonchalantly. He used to work here, but he passed away some time ago, and we believe he's still making his rounds checking in on the children. I had never seen any pictures of this doctor, yet every child recounted the same image. It was an eerie realization that perhaps those we've lost continue to watch over their charges, existing in a space between our reality and theirs. And that was from Jerry F. R. N. I got to say, yeah. <laughs> if I die and I'm still having to go to work, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> I was literally thinking that. I was like, this poor man has to go to work. I, know. I, like, God, no, I can't get away from this. <laughs> this trap perpetually <laughs> in your job. Yeah. That would be awful. Yeah. Ugh. That's the scariest thing that anybody yeah. has said tonight. <laughs> no, exactly. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay, and I think this is my last one, yes. And it is from a website called allnurses.com. This story was told to me from a nurse on the fifth floor neuro unit. The nurse was at the desk, and a guy in white nursing garb came through the double doors, walked into an empty room, and didn't come back out. The nurse thought it was strange, so he went into the room, and it was empty. He went to the double doors and opened them, and there were two respiratory techs talking at the entrance. They swore they'd been there talking the whole time, and no one had come through the doors. When one of his co-workers returned from lunch and he explained what happened, she said, Oh, that's just Bob. Um, he worked here as an I IVN. What's an IVN? IVN? Yeah. What's that? Maybe that's a misprint. He worked. Oh, oh, maybe an IV nurse. I don't know. Maybe it says he worked here uh, anyway, years ago and was accused of molesting a child. He was <laughs> sure he was about to be arrested. So he jumped out the window in that room and killed himself. But we see him all the time. <laughs> Pedos hanging around. Right. Bye. 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 Bobby. Yeah. Bye. Mm -hmm. See Get him out of there. So evidently, I bet you could go to any hospital across the nation or probably around the world and you would find someone with a story similar to those, oh, yeah. you know, about somebody that had died and came back to life or somebody or they see somebody, some patient or doctor that's passed on or nurse. Um, yeah. 
So oh, that, those were my stories. I thought they were pretty uh, kind of creepy, but, but yeah. short and sweet, you know. But Lindsay, I know you have some near death experience stories to share. I do. Mm. Well, I have a couple near death experiences and I have one that's kind of like an outer body experience. Ooh, when I think I of near death experiences, I kind of was thinking of stories of people that died and came back. Yeah. That's just automatically where my brain goes. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just like really close calls with death. Sometimes mm -hmm. it is dying and coming back. It, it can be either or. But I did find one that's kind of like an outer body experience, which is what I think of when I think mm -hmm. of near death experience. And then I will end my session off with something really creepy. Mm -hmm. a, little, a, little, <laughs> a little something creepy and spicy. To leave us with. spicy. Okay. Oh. Not like that. Not spicy. <laughs> well, I figured. Not like I figured it wasn't like that. <laughs> it's like just you got exciting. ghosts behind you. <laughs> know, yeah, champ standing guard there behind you. It's right there. Okay. Um. So my first story is from Alex Behemoth on Reddit. Now, just a trigger warning. This does talk a little bit about suicide and hanging. So Ooh, I should have given a trigger warning. I'm sorry. Well, we can maybe put one at the beginning of yeah, the yeah, yeah, or like in the show notes or something. Okay. And he says, when I was six or seven years old, I was walking by the living room and saw my parents watching a Western on TV. There was a guy who was about to be hanged. The movie dramatized the scene and the ambiance made it dreadful. As a child, I was curious and thought about how scary it would be to be in such a situation. I moved on and went outside to the front of the house. There was a large tree where my cousins and I would play. It had a rope tied to it with a noose. I believe we used it we used it to swing by putting our feet in it, but not too sure. It was a small, thin colored rope my grandpa collected from sacks of feet. I found a five gallon paint bucket. I put it next to the tree and swung the rope to a higher branch. At this point, curiosity had gotten the better of me and I wanted to feel the dread that having a rope around your neck and being close to death would cause. What kind never... of six year old does that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, kids, sorry. Kids are weird. I, I can't. They are. They're just weird. They're weird little kids. Um, I never actually planned on killing myself. I just wanted the sensation and then I would stop. So he wasn't like going to actually hang. He just wanted to have it around his neck and pretend that he was <sighs> in the movie is what I'm thinking. Hmm. After I stood on the bucket, I realized the rope was too high for me to put my neck in. So I looked around and found a small paint can. I put it on top of the gallon bucket and stepped on it. It was just high enough for me to get my neck inside the noose. Although, as I stepped on the small paint can, I noticed that it was shaky and unstable. I had a moment in which I reconsidered if it was too dangerous, but I figured that I could quickly put my neck in and out before anything happened and I would be fine. So I did. Fine. When I put the noose around my neck, I quickly became disappointed. There was no feeling of dread or fear, nothing. I felt the same as I felt without a noose around my neck. So I began to take the rope off my neck when I felt the can tip over. There was no time to think at that point. It seemed like my body was acting on its own. My hands tried to grab the rope around my neck, but couldn't grab onto anything as the rope was too thin anyways. My feet on their tiptoes barely managed to touch the can, which was now on its side, but I could not press on, but I couldn't press on it as the can moved back and forth. Like it was kind of rolling on the gallon. Um, I couldn't find a position to stand on it. All of this is automatic. I'm not making any conscious decisions at this point. After a couple of seconds, I began to realize that I was going to die and began to feel scared and panicked. But then I kind of just accepted the situation and accepted death. Everything began to turn black and the situation I was in wasn't there anymore. It's like it didn't matter. I remember, okay, and also this is common in near-death experiences. Like it's the acceptance is pretty common. At least what I read. I remember thinking it was so stupid that I was going to die in this way, that me at such a young age died in such a stupid way. Thinking about it, this thought was weird and that I can't imagine me as a child thinking like that. As I truly accepted death and everything was black, I could only retain a sense of feeling. I felt warmth, love, and peace. There was something that was emanated from that. I remember thinking, death is not that bad. I didn't feel pain or anything from my body as it was probably still hanging. Then 
I felt the can shoot itself upright, like if a precise force changed its position firmly and instantly. I didn't have much time to think as I came back. I quickly took off the noose and got off of the can. As I got off, a car slowed down with the man inside looking at me. I was at this point very ashamed at what a stupid thing I had done, so I hoped he didn't see anything and ran inside the house. I didn't tell this event to anyone for about 15 years. I was so ashamed that I could do something so stupid that I didn't want anyone to know. As a kid, I remember my parents talking about everyone having their own guardian angel. So I imagined it made more sense that an angel saved me than that my feet, while I was in that blackout state, managed to flip the cans with such a force and precision when I could barely touch it with my tiptoes while I was conscious. Wow. That kid dumb. <laughs> Straight to jail. Straight to jail. <laughs> My God. Yeah. That was weird. And then there were like a lot of comments saying, you know, how did the paint can tip back? Like, what do you think mm -hmm. happened? And he was basically just like, the only explanation I have for it is that I had a guardian angel. Like something yeah. was watching out for me that day. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Whew. Yeah. I just thought that one was. Uh, Can you imagine what his mom and dad would have done if they'd have seen that? He'd been getting a whooping. It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> probably they would, probably would have been traumatized. Like, what did I do to make my kid want to? Oh, yeah, it? not true. Then they would have yeah. gave. Because <laughs> I'm yeah. thinking, like, this kid is six years old, six or seven years old. Probably yeah. hadn't ever seen anything like that before. Hadn't never like experienced anybody hanging. So when they saw that on the TV, probably just got really curious about what it was and what it meant. And that's traumatic, though. Kids that's are weird. So I don't know yeah. how else to say it. They're just oh. they're weird little people. Wow. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I have another one. Can I ask you a quick question before you get into? Yeah. Um, in the stories that you found, like the near death experiences mm -hmm. is it like you said the acceptance comes but did you find a common thread of people feeling like peaceful after mm -hmm. that like warm loved whatever yeah and <clears throat> when i first started looking up stuff about near death and outer body experiences <laughs> It's funny because you have people that are religious that tell these stories of every religion that tell these stories. You mm -hmm. have people that are not religious mm -hmm. that tell these stories. And every story that I've heard, there's always some kind of bright light or some kind of warmth or entity that's there and welcoming and making you feel loved. But it's not anything specific. Like it's not right, a specific right. person. Like they can't say, Oh, it, I mean, some people are like, it was Jesus for sure, but it sounds very similar across the board, mm -hmm. no matter what your religion is. No matter what so, your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel was, like I've read some articles and like a lot of people seem to like equate the feeling to like being wrapped in a warm blanket. Yeah. Just like a kind of a safe, cozy. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Now, this one doesn't really say how they got into this near-death experience they're more talking about what it is and how it made them feel and trying to explain that so this is from inner symphony on reddit and they said i felt like i was taking up three-fourths of the room like i was crammed into it and my soul was too big for where i was standing i felt like a giant then I felt my entire awareness expand into an extra dimension beyond the 3D plane. Like my entire mind was consumed by the true depth of what reality is really like. I'd always thought that when someone described the other side as being more real than real, that they meant that it felt like 8K resolution while we're living in a 4K resolution now. That's not the case at all. There's an entirely new depth dimension of realness to true reality. The difference is greater than when you compare a 2D image to something three-dimensional. I really can't stress this enough. To compare it to how reality for us on Earth feels like right now, it's like the difference between a dream and being awake. It felt like one would need to qualitatively combine a thousand Earth realities 
to match the depth of realness that the other place has. It's like we're on earth having inserted ourselves into Sims characters or dolls in a dollhouse to play. Everything on earth looks plastic and fake to me since that day. I instantly felt the most intense love and life feeling if the word life had an essence that was completely unimaginable and that words cannot describe. The love I felt was so intense that I could physically feel it throughout my soul body and I instantly recoiled in horror at the realization that all of my suffering on earth was meaningless and that true reality is nothing but love and life. There was a soul song that had a depth slash dimension to it that no audio or song on earth has or could ever compare to. It was like the hum of millions of voices, each talking distinctly and individually, but together in a wholeness to create a single sound that vibrated my very being and imbued the very essence of the words life and love into my soul. The atmosphere was like the lively chatter of a tropical rainforest if the density were multiplied by millions of times. It was so beautiful and felt so good that I was crying the whole time. The feeling is so distinct and unique that trying to explain this to you is like trying to explain what it's like to see to someone who's been blind since birth. You really can't understand even if I tell you. It's not just a sixth sense. You're literally incapable of imagining what it's like even if I explain for thousands of pages. It's just so naturally unfathomable to the human mind. I never could have imagined such a feeling if I was given all the time in the world to contemplate. Neither can you. My mind felt faster and more intelligent than the fastest of the world's supercomputers combined and multiplied. Wow. I so that's that so interesting. So <laughs> was that somebody who actually medically died and came back or? This one, I couldn't find out. I couldn't find their original post about how they died or yeah, okay. they died and came back. But I'm assuming that they died and came back mm -hmm. and that's what they experienced but That's interesting i know and when i was looking up stuff about this i kind of was wanting to try to find out like what's going on in the brain as this mm -hmm. is happening and there's been a lot of studies actually like medical studies about near-death experiences and where they could come from like is there a specific thing that has to happen to give you a near-death experience and I think one of them studied like cardiac arrest patients, maybe, mm -hmm. and that a lot of them that had near death experiences had really similar near death mm -hmm. experiences. And one of the articles I read said something along the lines of like when when you're dying and your brain is like the oxygen is slowing down to your brain, it can kind of trigger. Um, different chemicals in your brain to react like some people you know take DMT to experience hallucinations and stuff and that's one of the chemicals that gets released into your brain as you're dying that kind of slows time down makes you have these hallucinations and a lot of them think that that's where this near-death experience can come from that your brain is just trying to trigger all of your good memories and one thing that I read that was really interesting and I don't remember what article it was from, said that when all of this is happening, your brain can, your brain knows that it's dying. So it kind of lets down all of its walls of memory. And so all of your old memories come flooding back that you've forgotten about from your childhood and all of these memories and these sensations and these people. And I think a lot of the studies were looking into the gray matter and, and kind of what happens there when you're as you're dying it was so interesting and then i came across this concept of quantum immortality and i think i'm i think i'm going to do a whole episode on that just mm. on its own because it's it's a very interesting theory that there are all these different yous on all these different dimensions mm -hmm. and when you have a near-death experience or you <clears throat> feel like you avoided something that possibly means that one of your, one of yourselves in another dimension did die. Oh, wow. And looking into how we could theoretically be immortal because of that. And I just think it's so interesting. That is, that's yeah. wild. And it's so like, I was, I was trying to get into it today because I didn't know if I wanted to include it or not. 
but it is one of those things that's very if you're not really reading it and paying attention uh-huh. to it it's just gonna go right over your head yeah. and I was like oh, I don't have enough time to dedicate to this right now but I'm gonna do more research on it because it is a very interesting I'd never heard about this before me either that does so, sound so interesting so let me ask you um and and I want to hear what Courtney thinks about this too mm-hmm. so when you were reading that it made me you know how a lot of people who have near-death experiences or they say my whole life flashed before my eyes you know and so that kind of what you said is going on in the brain kind of helps explain that um and Courtney, I know we think you're the medical health professional with knowledge of everything. She knows a lot. <laughs> no. <laughs> but what do you think about that? I mean, um, have you ever had any patients or or maybe colleagues that have described patients who have come back or had those near-death experiences? I haven't. And I don't know anyone who has has but like you read articles about it online Mm -hmm. and stuff i like reading about stuff like that yeah and like yeah that dmt is released in your brain when you're dying and like who's to say we're not all in that space right now i mean Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i have heard that the multiverse thing that Lindsay talked about um that like when you have deja vu it just means you and one of your other multiverse copies are doing the same thing yeah Oh, doing the same thing at the same time you are. I Mm -hmm. think it's so interesting. I love stuff like that. We kind of touched on that a little bit, too, in some past episodes. The doppelganger one. Yeah. 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 That was such a good episode. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it, listeners. (laughs) It was a good episode. (laughs) It was creepy. I think Lindsay was scared for like... (laughs) I just, I still cannot get past that story. I know. Of that I pregnant know. woman Ugh. seeing herself in the mirror still. And like yeah. her husband saw her crawling backwards on the bed. I will never forget that story. I like it. It will haunt my dreams forever. That woman just like straight started shooting at her doppelganger as soon as she saw it. She didn't even ask <laughs> no pop, questions. Pop, yeah. She's like, no. Absolutely <laughs> not. Get out of here. This is my life. <laughs> okay. So and I do have. Um, one or two just creepy hospital stories that I saw that will tie into my grand finale at the end. Oh, Oh, grand finale. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Okay. Now, this one is from Bubbly Pessimist on Reddit. (laughs) Bubbly (laughs) Pessimist. That's a great name. That is a good name. That really really do be be describing me sometimes, though. (laughs) Okay. And they said, It was my second night with this patient in his late 80s. He was terminally ill and was leaving for home hospice. In the middle of the night, I go to do vitals, and he's talking out loud in his sleep and fidgeting. Hadn't done it the night before, so I wake him up and ask ask him what he was dreaming. Tells me he was dreaming about being with his friends when he was younger, like going to the bar and partying. Said it was some of his favorite times in his life. I thought that must have been a great damn dream and left when I finished care. A couple hours later, I had left with a coworker to pick up a patient. When I returned, all of my coworkers are freaking out, even our senior nurses. My patient was on a portable video because he could be forgetful at times. And on the camera, they had witnessed multiple orbs shooting through the room that had looked similar to shooting stars. We get that from time to time, but they said that there was a crazy amount to where the room looked like it was glowing. Some coworkers even went in to check. When they did, The video person said they disappear, then return when the staff left. By the time I returned, the orbs had just stopped. About 15 to 30 minutes later, my patient wakes up and decides to get up from the bed. I go in there and thought it was weird for him because he didn't really do that at night prior. I ask him where he's going. He points to an area behind me and says that his friends are here and want to play cards with him. My coworker who was with me paled. I just said that they should play cards when it was a little later and tucked him into bed. I thought that this whole situation was pretty wholesome. My coworkers thought I was nuts, but I was like, his friends just wanted to stop by and say hi. Yeah. Wow. Why do play cards with his ghost friends? Isn't that so sweet? That's wild because multiple people witnessed the, the these orbs. orbs. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. God, I really liked that story, though. I thought that it was, was a good one. 
Yeah, because he's remembering his life when he was young and still could get around and do stuff and mm-hmm. be a hooligan. <laughs> yeah, just cause some chaos, you know? It's so sweet. And it, and it's so wild how a ma- the majority of them are so similar. You know, yeah. it like Lindsay said, doesn't matter what faith or culture you're from. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really weird. All right. So I found how much we don't understand. I found my last story and then mm. I actually have something to show you guys that will mm. to that show. We'll oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. okay. So this is from Artiverse on Reddit and they said haven't had any experiences as a nurse, but when I was a night shift CNA in a locked residential behavioral unit, really old building, I had a few. She has three little short ones. Okay. So number one, I had a resident who was presumably A and O nonverbal blank stare, took care of her for about two years and never heard her talk once. She was fairly young, 50s and ambulatory, but only if you led her around. One night I was stalking the room and it was pretty dark. I had thought she was sleeping. My back was turned and from the bed, I heard a really low toned voice say, he's here for me. I startled and turned around quick to see her sitting up and looking directly at me, pointing to the opposite corner of the room. Uh, I was inwardly freaking out and I just nodded and left. Came back the next night and she had died. Oh my God. She did like you, Court, and she was like, peace out. Yep. (laughs) Not my problem. He's He's, here. He's here for me. (laughs) Well, you best get on along the way then. I'm not even lying to you. I think that at that point, if I'm in a dark hospital room and I hear that from, coming from behind me, I would simply pass away. I really, <laughs> truly think that my, no, really, I think that my brain would just take me Shut out. Down. It would say, That's you know it. what, girly, I'm taking us out of the situation and you're welcome. <laughs> I would be saying, who's here? <laughs> It would take it here. Okay, this next one's kind of sweet though, but it's sweet, but it's scary. Okay, the resident who was there for wondering behaviors due to dementia was a huge favorite among staff since he was so sweet. He called me Miha and had a very distinct voice. Unfortunately, likely had COVID at the very beginning of the pandemic before they had the antigen tests available, was placed on isolation in the single private room on the unit. Supposedly recovered, but developed pneumonia a few weeks later and passed mm. away. I did the postmortem care. A few days later, administration decided that the locked unit staff were to remain separate from the rest of the building due to COVID and converted the private room into the staff break room. It was a plastic table and a microwave. Anyway, I'm sitting there eating dinner at 2 a.m. when the hair on my arm stands up. I get up from the table and poke my head out into the hall and see no one. And very clearly over my left shoulder, I hear, Miha, gave me chills. Can't say whether it was my head or not, but it freaked me out. Oh, but that is cute though. Like it's sweet, but it's just creepy. Yeah. I think it's wild how our bodies respond before our minds do, actually. Yeah. Like when you're it. in a situation when you know something is not quite right, mm-hmm. and, and you always listen to your instincts. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Even if it seems like it doesn't make any sense, you should still listen to your instincts. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Okay, so this last one. Had a resident who self-ambulated to the bathroom at night pretty frequently with a walker and oxygen. We would listen and check on him when he was done. Another CNA and I were charting and talking in the hall around midnight when we heard him get up and go to, into the bathroom, toilet flush, and bedroom light turned on. She stops talking and turns white. The resident had died several days prior and both of us realized at the same time no one was in the room but the light was on and the bathroom door opened. Mm -mm. That's like that good old story where it's like, hey, doesn't Nancy work here? Nancy's been dead for 10 years. (laughs) She (laughs) died 10 years ago. What what story is that? Is that on a movie? It was on some TV show. There's always that that joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah, They they keep seeing somebody and everyone's like, she's dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry y'all could hear Ladybug barking a while ago. Oh, that's fine. She's fine. Okay. Um. Oh, gosh. (laughs) 
this this last one i had seen this picture years and years and years ago like when i was in high school not that i want to date myself but you know i'm not that old it wasn't that long ago but <laughs> like um, two three years ago yeah I, <laughs> yeah um i had seen it like a really long time ago and just thought it was so creepy and interesting and it just popped back into my brain today because I knew we were going to be doing these types of stories. Oh gosh. <laughs> so I'm going to put, I'm going to put this picture up. And if you're just listening on the podcast, please go watch on YouTube because this is probably single-handedly one of the only pictures that I have ever seen that has like freaked me out, giving me chills. Well, can we put it on our socials? Yeah. We, possibly i don't know oh, okay. i mean it's creepy okay what are we looking at well, just look at it for a second just take it in it's like just a bedside table and an iv pole and a chair okay here's the backstory behind this photo okay and you can see the photo itself is of a like a tv screen uh -huh. and with all my research today, now this has been, okay, this has been debunked, all right? But Aww. here's the backstory. Back back. So a nurse one night was watching this patient in this room, and you can see the, the patient's bed, whatever. Mm -hmm. She said that this black form that you can see in the middle that's like almost like really creepily crouching over the bed mm -hmm. had appeared for like, two minutes or so and like moved around the room and then like the patient died like a few hours later and everybody she didn't this specific person that told the story didn't say that it was a demon but looking at the picture that's immediately where my mind goes that's a demon so there's what you're saying is there's a patient in the bed mm-hmm but do you see how it looks like there's something standing yeah. on oh, yeah. the bed? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. So it was debunked, so it's not real? I'll show you. I'll show you another picture in just a second. Okay. It kind of shows where things are. But, and I could have swore that there was a second picture that it w when it was like in a different pose, but I could not find that one to save my life. But I swear I remember that there were two pictures of the uh -huh. same thing and that this figure had different poses in each so it wasn't the same thing in each one okay but here is another picture that kind of fixes everything for you so in reality the thing that our brain is making into a figure is really just ordinary objects that are kind of close together. And in that dimly lit room, it makes it look like there is a person standing on the bed. But the top part of it uh, is a coat hanging in the background. And okay. then the part the where you can kind of legs. see the leg coming down uh -huh. is the bed rail. And the patient himself, one of his legs was uncovered. Oh, so gotcha. you can see like his knee and his leg coming down. And yeah. that, that's the entity's leg. But if you didn't know any of that information and you just saw this yeah, picture, exactly. Can you just picture me in high school. Oh yeah. Just surfing on the computer one night, <laughs> comes across this. <sighs> and I was like, oh, that's that's obviously a supernatural being. For sure. No question. <laughs> yeah. No doubt 100%. in my mind. Yep. Yeah. And that goes to show you too that there's there's a lot that can be explained. Yeah, there's, a, I mean, most yeah. things probably can be debunked, but it is kind of fun to think about what it could be. <laughs> yeah. And I think what makes this so creepy and convincing to me is that in my mind, if I'm thinking of like a Grim Reaper type of yeah. entity, most of the time you think of it standing still, having the big, what is it called that he Bye. carries? The big scythe just yeah. kind of quietly standing there you can't see his face he's just really still but but this looks like it is freaking grudge crawling all over the room Reach okay down for him yeah yeah it looks like it is coming 
for this patient in the bed, going to grab it up, poof it somewhere else. It yeah. just looks very like the movement that it's making. You can't even really tell what kind of pose it has or what the hell it's even doing <laughs> up there. Is it dancing? I don't know. But it looks just so odd uh-huh. and so oh, just weird that you when know, I, the first time I ever saw it, I really was scared. I really was like, holy shit, like that is, that's something right there. I don't know what it is, but it's something. It reminds me of that movie Ghost when the bad guys die and the black things come up out of the ground and drag them down. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Okay, yeah, that would scare me if I didn't know what it was. But once <laughs> you was, told me, that was my finish. That was my grand finale. <laughs> it is once you like once you see what it really is, you can't mm-hmm. unsee it after that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so creepy. Yeah. That's yeah, what the entity wants was, you to think. It is. I swear there was another picture, like there was a second picture where it was in a different pose. Yeah, maybe my brain's just making this up, but I swear that there were two pictures. Was it? A, I wonder if it was a camera that went like spanned across the room slowly or but something. it was still from that angle the one yeah, i remember yeah. oh, okay. was from that same angle and was it was the picture that i showed somebody had taken of like one of those old tv monitors yeah of this thing Ooh. so and mm-hmm. there's no information on who took the picture or what hospital was it at or who mm-hmm. even posted this online there's no information about that but the story goes that the nurse saw this figure appear and then disappear after a few minutes. And then the guy died like hours later. (sighs) And so that picture with that backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. (laughs) I think I'm (laughs) done for the night. Thank you. (laughs) I think I'm done. (laughs) Well, on that note, if our listeners have any uh, stories themselves, hopefully we have some, um, health professionals listening if uh, if you have some stories some uh, weird things you can't explain we would love to hear about them and um i'm gonna what what are you laughing about it took me a second to orient <laughs> our pictures with the banner so we were just all over the place okay good now <laughs> good. so send in your listener stories even if they're not about the hospital or near-death experiences we love all spooky stories so send those in to us at sirens of the supernatural at gmail.com um, we keep waiting for some some stories to come in. We had some like right when we first started the podcast, um, but hadn't had a lot since then. So we would love to get some of those and share those um, on the air. Mm-hmm. And um, Lindsay will tell you about our social media. And before she does that, I want to thank Courtney for coming on. We had such a good time. It's like a good time. Thanks family reunion. One of these days we'll have to get Aaron on here with us. Oh, Lord. <laughs> That'd be like a it's four a hour, hour episode. Oh, yeah. My gosh. You'd be going all night. Energetic. <laughs> yes. But anyway, thank you, Courtney, for coming on and sharing with us. I, what you had to say was was interesting, and it's neat to get the perspective of somebody that works in in the hospital, especially in the creepy, dark hallways and then <laughs> in the ER like you do now. Oh, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> oh, well, it's a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. but you are good at it. You are good at it. All right, guys. Well, if you want to follow us on socials, we are at Sirens of the Supernatural on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And on TikTok, we are at Supernatural Sirens. So with that, we're going to leave you. And I hope that you stay spooky. Stay spooky. (laughs)